There is a lot of suffering in this world. There is suffering that is tragic, both personal and in our community and far away. There is suffering caused by evil and by blunder, but also suffering that is disease and no one's fault. On Good Friday, we spend time in solidarity with this suffering. And we refuse glib optimism that would superficially resolve the pain, the uncertainty, and the questions. Not only is the world's current suffering staggering, but when I look at human history, what we've done to each other, and to God's creation, the immensity of our cruelty actually makes me feel a dull hopelessness and fear. I had such an experience this week when I was thinking I'd do a little light reading. And I picked up this book called Ten Birds That Changed the World, and I thought, oh, I just want to read a little natural history and enjoy my evening. But instead, I came upon the story of the Guani Cormorant and its history utterly disturbed me. Let me read a little from this book. The men worked with very few hours of respite with back-breaking labor. Before dawn, they had been working in the night, 20 hours a day, six days a week, throughout the entire year. Before the sun rose, they began working in the darkness using picks and shovels at the quarry. They loaded this heavy and malodorous, malodorous substance into wheelbarrows, the guano of the guani cormorant, which would be shipped on cargo ships as fertilizer. Each man had to produce five tons worth of barrels filled of this substance. And if they refused or disobeyed, they were shot on the spot. For sustenance, each worker was given a portion of rock-hard bread, dried meat, and rice full of maggots. Scurvy was rampant because they had no vegetables. They suffered conjunctivitis and respiratory diseases from mining the guano. These men were brought here from Macau across the Pacific Ocean. They were Chinese laborers who thought they were going to California to be a part of the gold rush. But instead, they were transported to these islands called the Chinca Islands of Peru. And there they were enslaved. On the journey, they were in cramped quarters in virtual darkness. And some people knew their fate were going to be horrific. And so some jumped overboard, and some hung themselves, and some stabbed themselves to death so that they would not face the horrors at the end of their journey. Between 1850 and 1874, 87,000 Chinese workers were enslaved on these islands. When they arrived from these ships, 
they traded one form of hell for another, all enslaved to work on the most valuable commodity in the entire history of global trade, the guano of the guane cormorant that would be used for fertilizer and change everything we knew about farming. When I read this, I confess to you how I realized I, don't, I know so little about what all is going on, all the suffering hidden from my sight. And not only that, these were my people. I had no idea. When I first started reading the story, I thought they were black. As an American understanding slavery, I thought these must be black people. But these were Chinese. When I read this story, I had the same feeling I had when I first learned of the lynching of the Chinese in California during the Chinese Exclusion Act. And when I looked on those pictures of the Chinese lynched as they swayed in the trees and their tongues hung out and their faces were blue and their eyes were bulging, it scared me on a very personal level. It had become very proximate, this kind of suffering. I could imagine if I were here and my family were here just a few years earlier, could they have been my brothers? Could they have been my father? What would it be like for all of us to come that proximate to pain and suffering, feel it in our own body. I recall when speaking with a priest at the time when Russia started attacking Ukraine and the Ukrainian, Ukrainians were fleeing for their lives. And this Anglo priest said to me, astonished at the suffering, and he said, they look like us. By us, of course, he meant white. When suffering can come that proximate to our bodies, whether they be black bodies, yellow bodies, or white bodies, it can touch very close to a place that feels Wow, it could be that close. Most of the time we live in Silicon Valley here, and we're generally very safe. We don't starve. When was the last time you wondered if you could get a meal? And most of the time, we have sunshine to spare. And so it's very hard to reach to those places that are far away, not just because they're far, but because, or because they're historical, but because they're not in our bodies. We don't see that in our bodies. And this is what happens on Good Friday. God suffers in God's body, coming proximate to all the pain and suffering, a God who would know all the suffering and the pain. And we testify to this truth on Good Friday, that out of God's immense love for the world, 
And not just world in an abstract way, but because God is God, God understands each and every person's suffering. And God has taken on that suffering out of immense love to be close to everyone who suffers. That is the kind of love we mark today. So when Jesus came, he not only threw his lot in with all the crucified men on those hills of Jerusalem, and it wasn't just two others, it was hundreds of people on those hills of Jerusalem. He threw his lot in with them, with the black slaves that were in America, the Chinese slaves in Peru, the Ukrainians murdered in the war, the people of Gaza, and every reach that is beyond our sight and our perception in the world. He bore all this with us out of love. Jesus calls everyone his friend. And because we are his friends, he says, there is no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. And our God does this. What love is this? And this is Good Friday. Why do we call it good? Why do we call it good? Is suffering inherently good and redemptive? Should we chase after suffering? Should we think, oh, well, they're suffering, so they, they get brownie points? No. No. We call it good because on the day of crucifixion, God is here. There is no place where God is not. Like the word goodbye means God be with you, Good Friday is God's Friday. God plants God's very self among the suffering. It is solidarity. God's Friday is a day of solidarity, and it is a proclamation of the realities in which we live. The cross unveils human evil for what it is. Evil, the cruelty we wreck on each other and on the planet, is an affront to the purposes of God, God's purposes of justice and love that build up this thing called the abundant life that God desires for everyone. But are we up for it? It's hard, looking at all of it, to feel courage. And more relevant in my own context, where do I get the time? All this busyness, how, how, Lord, how do we participate in the repurposing of all that is cruel and broken for your love and justice so that all might share this abundant life that you want for us? And that is the question that the disciples asked. How? We don't know the way. Show us the way and we will be satisfied. And their hearts were filled with sorrow. And Jesus showed them the way. He told them, and today on Good Friday we read from the Gospel of John, the Gospel of John says that when Jesus died and rose and ascended, this three 
thing here is not just one thing that we mark on Good Friday for in the Gospel of John. It's this thing called being lifted up. He's lifted up on the cross, lifted up in resurrection, lifted up in the ascension. And all of this is folding in on each other. And this, this is the way. It's very hard to understand what this means to live in this paradox and in the simultaneous reality of crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. And yet, this is the invitation Jesus keeps giving back to the disciples. So that when it all happens, the suffering is never the only thing. It's never just the one thing. Jesus' ascension will always be part. The new life will always be a part. So how do I image this paradox? I've tried to image this paradox. And this is how I think about it. I consider the image of Jesus on the cross. And then I image this liquid light saturating the cross, saturating all that's around, the world and myself. So that the cross does not disappear, but it is one with this thing that Jesus calls my hour of glory. This hour of glory is not celebrating crucifixion and suffering. It means love still happens here. Love cannot be annihilated. And God can do this. And we we walk with this paradox because it is hard, hard to figure it out. But there's truth in it. If we cleave only to the crucifixion and think life is only suffering, we are not understanding this promise that Jesus gives us. That Jesus is bigger than this. God's love is bigger than this. And glory suffuses every reality. The light shines and ebbs and flows. And this is where we live. And the night before Jesus died, he promised his disciples several things that are really important for us to always remember. First, God the Father loves the whole world, including you. Second, he will be lifted up and ascended and abide within you. Third, he will send you another advocate the Spirit. So Jesus will be our advocate and the Holy Spirit will be our advocate and the Father's love will always be here. And then one last thing he gives us to each other. Love one another as I have loved you. With all this, the Father's love the abiding of Jesus within us, the advocate who comes to encourage us and one another, we are protected and given courage to continue in a world that won't get fixed as we desire, but we get to participate in the love that keeps pushing through. And when I say the world won't get fixed, 
what I mean is that it's a long road. Whatever needs to be accomplished will be accomplished in God's own devising. But we have the work. In the Gospel of John, he's always talking about the work. And what is the work? The work is the work of love. That's always the work. So let us take up this work, love bending toward justice, bending toward transformation, not forsaking the world in its suffering, but not being overwhelmed and consumed and annihilated by the world's suffering, but holding steady, loving one another, washing one another's feet, taking courage. And when it begins to dim, we close our eyes and imagine again that glory, that love, that saturates the cross, the world, and ourselves. Amen.